I have got three new recipes for you this week, and one of them is a sourdough recipe. So watch until the end. You do not want to miss this one. It is one of my favorites. I have lots of favorites, but <laughs> this sourdough recipe I'm going to show you is definitely close to the top of the list. And once I finish all of my cooking and share this week's recipes, we will talk a little bit about preparing for baby. I'm still planning on doing a full video on that, but I haven't gotten around to that yet. So we will just chat a little bit about what I am doing to get prepared. So let's start at the beginning and make an anniversary meal. So this was our anniversary. Well, we have two anniversaries because we got legally married before we got sacramentally married. And that is because we did not do what we should have done. We lived together and had two children before we got sacramentally married. It's not what you're supposed to do. <laughs> and that's not just an opinion. Look at statistics. It doesn't go well when you do that. And we found that out. It was tough. It was really tough. But, you know, we did, did the right thing as we knew we should do it. And we did get legally married. And we do celebrate that because that is a big step in the right direction. So on this day, I asked my husband what he wanted me to make for our anniversary dinner. And he said lasagna and carrot cake. So that's what was on the menu. And um, I make my lasagna pretty well, totally from scratch. So um, it's a little bit, it's, it's definitely not a 30 minute meal. Let's just say that. <laughs> so garlic is one of those things that you do not want to skimp on when making an Italian dish of any sort, really. And I still got plenty of garlic and onion from last year's garden. So I went ahead and just started this meal pretty early in the day. That way, if the day got crazy, then, you know, I would at least have it finished. Now, tonight, I have to take my daughter to one of her extracurricular activities. So um, we'll be eating when I get back home. It's going to be really, really late. But at least I'll have the meal prepped. So while I'm in the background, you can see to the left there, my big Dutch oven, I've got um, sausage and ground beef going in, browning in there. And now while that is browning, I chopped up my onion and garlic and I'm grating some carrots for the carrot cake. So I'm multitasking <laughs> big time here. And since I am getting somewhat close to baby time, I am making a triple batch of this lasagna so that I can make one batch tonight for us and then I will freeze two batches as well to start my uh, postpartum food prep. You know, doing it this way as opposed to having like a huge meal prep day, I kind of prefer it because it's really not that much extra work. I'm already cooking, so it's just making more of what I am already making. And I get to see what it would be like to be a mom of like 10 or 12 kids and have to make this much all the time. So this is a huge pot of meat sauce that I have going because like I said, it is a triple batch. So all of these recipes will be linked in the description for you guys in detail. That's why I'm not telling you all the measurements exactly as we go because they, it will be linked. But just keep in mind that I'm tripling everything for the lasagna. That is why... It is just a lot of food. Now, anytime I make a red sauce with meat, I let it simmer a long time. So several hours. That's why I'm starting this early in the day because it's just so much better when it has time to simmer. I'm going to make the pasta from scratch as well, so I, I have to do that. I might as well just get this going and, you know, let it simmer while I'm doing the rest of my work. This is something that, you know, when I was a new wife and mom, it kind of took some practice to mentally plan and prepare for my day so that I had time for everything. But now I don't even have to think about it. It's just second nature. And again, John and I have been together for like 14 years. So that's, that's enough practice, right? <laughs> you should, you should get 
to where anything, if you do it that long, is really like second nature. And, you know, it's true for motherhood, too. So many things with having babies, raising babies, it just gets so much easier as you go if you stay focused and don't get distracted and pulled away by other things. So I got my sauce simmering. Now I'm moving on. I'm going to work on my carrot cake because that's another thing when you're baking a cake from scratch, especially this is a layer cake, you really do want the cake to cool completely before you frost it. Otherwise, your, your frosting is going to melt all over the place. I'm sure you all know that. Maybe you've done that before. I've done that before. Baked a cake in a hurry and tried to frost it. And yeah, it just ends up a mess. It's not set up. And that's no good. So this carrot cake, like I said, this is my probably, gosh, I don't know what his favorite dessert would be that I make. I know it's got to be between this carrot cake my gooey butter cake, and my coconut cream pie, which I think I have videos on all that, and most of it is on the blog. I don't know if the gooey butter cake's on the blog, but the coconut cream pie, I believe, is on the blog. But these, that would probably be his top three. So this cake recipe calls for buttermilk, and I didn't have buttermilk because I don't have a cow in milk right now, so I'm not making butter. I don't have buttermilk, but I do have milk. I do have vinegar. So if you ever you know, need a buttermilk substitution. You guys probably know this. This is pretty basic stuff. Just add a couple tablespoons of vinegar to milk and see it curdles and it it turns into like faux buttermilk. It's not buttermilk, it's fake buttermilk, but it will work for this recipe. So I'm gonna add that in and finish up my cake batter here. This recipe calls for two whole cups of grated carrots. That is a lot of grated carrots, so it is very carroty, but um, it's also very, very moist. It is not dry at all. I cannot stand dry cake. I'm totally not a food snob. Like, I'm never going to complain if somebody serves something. I will eat it. I think it's rude to complain. Um, you know, you should just eat what you're served unless it's totally inedible or something, but oh my gosh, dry cake. It's the worst. Um, and I'm sorry, but boxed cake, it's just, I know there are tricks to like make it moist and make it good, but oh, I don't like it. I'm not a fan. I'm kind of spoiled by um, cake from scratch. Here is the secret ingredient. This is the secret ingredient to the best carrot cake ever. And I'm not kidding. It's really, really good. It is peach jam. I know, I know you're thinking why peach jam? And that is because I have a lot of it and I always have a lot of it. I make a huge batch of peach jam every year and I'm always looking for recipes to just, you know, throw a little half pint in there. And I, I did it one time in my carrot cake and it stuck. You know, John said that was the best carrot cake he ever had. So that is how I have made it ever since. So that was, yeah, just a little half pint jar, which would be a cup of peach jam is the secret ingredient. I've never tried like I guess, you know, it'd be the same, kind of a similar effect to adding applesauce, which I'm sure you all have made cakes before where you add a little applesauce and that keeps it very moist. So I um, greased and floured my pans. I do not use nonstick spray. I'm still like very old school with that. I, I do like to grease and flour. So let me know in the comments, what team are you? Do you spray? Do you grease and flour? I do a lot of parchment paper too, but I just have found that this actually works better. You'll see when I pull these cakes out of the oven, they will not stick at all. <laughs> and I guess it does help that these are non-stick pans, but I don't even trust non-stick pans. I just don't, especially when you work so hard on a cake and it's a layer cake and you want it to, you know, set nice and evenly. You really don't want the bottom to stick to the pan. That's, that's just not good. So We've got that cake baking. We're going to move right along and make the pasta. Now, we have done this before. If you've been with me for, oh, well, gosh, this channel is not that old. <laughs> How old is it? Maybe a year and a half. But if you've been with me for a while, then we've done this before. We've made pasta. This is my pasta recipe. It is an egg pasta. Now, I've had some of you ask, why do I not make sourdough pasta? Well, I have before. I've made sourdough pasta before. And yes, that's technically probably the healthier way to do it. 
um, if you need long fermented flour. But you know, this is just like the old school Italian way is this way. <laughs> it's flour, salt, egg, and a little bit of oil. And this pasta is so delicious. So that is why I make it this way because it tastes so good. And once you make it this way, you don't really want to make it any other way. No offense, if you really like sourdough pasta, it's, it's good, it's not bad at all. This is just what I like. And look at this beautiful dough, it makes such a pretty dough. So I made, gosh, a triple batch, double or triple batch, maybe it was just double, I don't know. This is not one batch, so it's, it's more than one. Because like I said, I'm making three big lasagnas, three big nine by 13 dishes of lasagna. So I needed more pasta than usual. So I'll let that pasta rest on the counter in an airtight container or plastic bag, whatever, but just wrap it because it needs to rest a little bit before you roll it out, ideally. But if you let it rest and it's not wrapped or stored in something, then it's gonna dry out and it's not gonna roll out. So don't do that. Uh, my cakes are finished and they're just perfect. So I'm gonna let these set in cool and move right along to the next step. Now this is my pasta machine. I am not a pasta granny. If you don't know about pasta grannies, you have to follow pasta grannies here on YouTube and on Instagram. Amazing. It's like legit Italian grandmas making pasta and I could just sit and watch it all day because they're so good. Like you can tell they've just done this their whole life, you know, probably started as a little girl and they are masters. It's just masterful. It's amazing, but it takes skill to roll pasta out evenly and very thin. And it takes a lot of time. And you know, I'm not opposed to time. Clearly I'm making my own pasta. I'm not opposed to time or putting a little elbow grease in, but uh, this pasta machine is just pretty nice. I like it. It's very handy. It rolls very evenly and it also cuts pasta too into um, like wide egg noodles uh, or like fettuccine noodles or um, spaghetti. So this is a bit of a process, but I don't know, it's, it's not too bad. I would say from start to finish, not counting the rest time after you make your dough, it's maybe 15 minutes to mix up the dough, knead it, and then roll it out and cut it. And we're making lasagna today, so I don't even have to cut this into noodles. I'm just going to cut it into big um, sheets of lasagna noodles. This is just perfect for that. So there is a technique to doing this the right way to get nice, even sheets of pasta. And I have, I think I have a whole video on pasta making, and I have a whole blog post on how to do this. This is a great way to um, preserve, quote unquote, preserve your eggs, by the way. We're kind of getting ready to be into egg season. We're getting close to, somewhat close to spring. I don't know, it's still winter, but you know, spring's on the mind for me because chickens and cows and all that stuff. And you have lots of eggs, if you have chickens, you have lots of eggs coming in the spring. So I just had a contraction there. Um, I've still got a few weeks before baby, but I just get Braxton Hicks. I just do every time and then I go past 40 weeks and that's just how it is so sometimes those contractions will surprise you and make you pause a little bit but when you have lots of eggs coming in from your chickens um, you know you, you have more than you can use sometimes so it's always fun to try to think of ways to use them to preserve them and one way is to make a ton of pasta and let it dry and then you can actually store dried egg pasta um, I have a video on this you can do long-term storage and store it for years and years and years or you can just dry it out and store it in your pantry for a couple months I've stored dried pasta in my pantry like homemade dried egg pasta in my pantry for a couple months no mold whatsoever although it does remind me of a funny story I did an Instagram reel once where I was showing how to make pasta and dry it and store it. And I did a batch that had um, herbs in it. And everyone commented and was like, why is it moldy? Well, that was just bad planning on my part. I should have explained that there was like basil and whatever else I put 
in the pasta. But anyway, so now I'm, you saw that I cut my lasagna sheets and I'll just set those to the side. And then I have like the little scraps, the ends of my um, pasta sheets that I'm just rolling into noodles. And I will set those to the side, coat those in flour really well, and I'll let all that dry out. I actually ended up with, you know, from the ends, by the time I rolled out every sheet I had, I ended up with quite a few noodles. So add that to my dry pasta stash. Now I'm gonna set that pasta to the side and work on the cream cheese frosting for the carrot cake. And I have another secret ingredient here. This is eggnog. I mentioned this back at Christmas that I make an eggnog um, frosting for my carrot cake around that time of year. And you guys all, well, I, don't, I can never remember if I said it here on YouTube or on Instagram, but wherever I said it, everyone was like, ooh, eggnog carrot cake or eggnog frosting, I need that recipe. So when you click this recipe on my blog, the regular frosting recipe will be up, but I'll put the option for the eggnog as well. It is really, really, really good. And I guess, you know, if you don't want any alcohol in it, you, you could just do the non-alcoholic version, but it's such a small amount, like you're not going to become intoxicated from eating a slice of uh, carrot cake with a little bit of eggnog in the frosting, but I understand sometimes uh, people have reasons for just wanting to avoid that. However, I do cook with, um, I think I cook with wine. I will make like rum sauces for different desserts, so it's not something I avoid in my kitchen. All right, assembling my cake and see how this didn't stick at all. I'm telling you, team grease and flour or butter and flour, whatever you want to call it, that is the way to go. That's the way that the old grandmas, I don't know if we can even say grandmas, it's like great, great grandmas now because I think a lot of grandmas now were kind of like sexual revolution generation and I don't know if they baked cakes much. I think that was kind of considered a sign of oppression. So who knows, maybe, maybe some still did. <laughs> All right, so I got my cake frosted and I'm going to toast some coconut here, make it look pretty there there was coconut in the cake and there will be coconut on top of the cake as well so I've got that coconut toasting and I just toast my coconut on the stovetop in a cast iron skillet rather than turning the oven on and heating it up so while that I'm doing that I'm gonna make the ricotta mixture cheese mixture for my lasagna so yeah as you can see I'm just like kind of going back and forth between tasks <laughs> because this was just a lot this this lasagna and the carrot cake all from scratch um, obviously I wasn't doing this all day, but you know, there were just things, steps that needed to be taken all day. So I made the ricotta cheese mixture, set that to the side and my coconut is ready. And look at this cake. So pretty. So turned out great. And we got to have some on this particular night. And then the following night, my husband and his dad and our kids um, had an old man card party. That's what they call it when they play cards because apparently young people don't play cards anymore. So an old man card party and we got to take the leftover cake along. And that is one of John's favorite things is when I make something he really likes, he likes to take it places and make people eat my cooking. So, all right. After, after that cake was finished, I did need to finish my lasagnas, just assembling them here. I always start with the meat layer on the bottom and then add my pasta sheets, top them with ricotta, and then um, cheese. So here I'm using like a mix of provolone and mozzarella. It was already pre-shredded. So I, like I said, I cheated a little bit. It's not totally from scratch, that's okay. Um, in this nine by 13, I did three layers of the meat sauce, the pasta, the ricotta, and the shredded cheese. And I do cover my lasagna um, when I bake it at first, at least, so the top doesn't burn, and I bake it at 375 for about 45 minutes, and then, like, maybe the last 10, 15, I'll take the foil off, but it's such a bummer when you work hard on a meal, and you know it's going to be pretty, and it's going to be delicious, but then you burn the top, and it's like, you know, the whole thing's not ruined, but the presentation is ruined, so that's why I cover it. I started out covered. Now, I, while that was baking, I finished up my other two lasagnas, and I'll just set these to the side and kind of 
um, the sauce was still hot. So I'll let them cool before they go in the freezer. And now I've got my first two postpartum meals ready to go. Now we're fast forwarding to the next day because like I said, I had to take my daughter somewhere and we didn't get to eat till super late, but this was the finished product. So, so good. Very, very cheesy, not low calorie. You have been warned. All right, so this was the next morning. Now here we are going to make a sourdough recipe. This is actually a sourdough discard recipe. So it is a very quick recipe. We are making sourdough discard cinnamon rolls and they take 30 minutes from start to finish. 30 minutes, there's no rise time, no bulk fermentation time. And that is because the dough is actually biscuit dough. So you can see I was mixing up flour, a little baking powder, a little sugar and salt. I added in my butter, just like you would for biscuit dough. And now I am adding in my sourdough starter. This starter is actually pretty active. Um, but you can use active starter, you can use discard. This recipe is on my blog in detail. It will be linked in the description for you guys. Going to add an egg, a little bit of milk, get my biscuit dough to come together. When you're making any kind of like buttery pastry or biscuit dough, you don't want to knead because you want to work quickly so you still have those chunks of butter and you know it's nice and flaky. So now I'm going to roll out this dough and you guys have seen me, I have use this uh, biscuit dough, sourdough biscuit dough for several things. This is like my go-to multi-purpose dough. And I actually have a few more things that I use it for that I haven't shown you. And, uh, you know, we'll just have to do that sometime. I'll have to add that to my list, but I, this is the dough I use for sourdough dumplings. It's just a great all-purpose dough. So I mixed up the filling. Like I said, this whole process is so quick. This is like one of my favorite things to make on the weekend when I want something really good for breakfast, but I don't have time, <laughs> like eight to 12 hours to let true sourdough cinnamon rolls bulk ferment. So I rolled out the dough into a big 12 by 18 rectangle, spread my uh, cinnamon sugar filling mixture over top of that, rolled it up, and now I'm going to cut into 12 cinnamon rolls. This makes a dozen cinnamon roll biscuits or cinnamon rolls, whatever you want to call them. So I use a piece of thread. I actually didn't learn this until I was in my 20s. So for a few years, I made cinnamon rolls and I cut them with a knife and it would always smash them. And I'd get so aggravated, like, why aren't mine pretty like the cookbooks? And then I figured out the trick. You have to use either like dental floss or a piece of thread to cut your cinnamon rolls if you don't want to smash them, if you want them to be pretty and round like this. So I use a cast iron skillet when I'm making these. I preheat the skillet in the oven so it's nice and hot. Oh, and by the way, we are having eggs and bacon on the side, just showing you guys to prove that I didn't just serve carbs for breakfast. We are having protein too. Anyway, I bake in a, ca in a preheated cast iron skillet with some browned butter in the bottom, and it just makes the bottoms really crispy, but then the actual cinnamon rolls themselves are buttery and flaky and so soft. Oh man, it's just the best, just the best. And then I've got cream cheese frosting. We're doing a lot of cream cheese frosting this weekend, so oopsie. Um, once again, not low calorie. Gonna top these with the frosting, and there they are. So good, but yeah, I need to just have one, not the whole pan, which would be or whole skillet, which would be very, very easy to do. So moving right along, let's chat just a little bit about the baby, because the baby will be coming kind of soon, in a few weeks. We haven't got a few weeks yet. Um, I got a few things. I didn't need much. Babies don't need much. You don't need much when you're having a baby, but I do cloth diapers, so it was time. You know, I've cloth diapered all of my kids in some capacity. The first few, it was just a little bit because I was working and, you know, a uh, babysitter didn't want to use cloth and all that. But um, I've gotten more and more, like the last one, my fourth, I exclusively cloth diapered. So I use flats and flats, it, it literally looks like a uh, flower sack cloth. Is that, am I saying that right? Flower sack towel? Why can I not say this? But it's, it's a flat diaper and then you fold it 
into a diaper shape and put it on a baby. I'm going to show you. See how this started out is just like a flat piece of cloth. Um, fold it up. And I'll, do, I'll probably do like a full in-depth video on cloth diapering too. I need to do that. And then you just put it on a baby. And you guys know how I feel about like showing too much of kids and babies in videos. And that is one thing I'm showing you on a Cabbage Patch doll because there are people out there who I know that most of you watching this are like great people probably have a lot in common with me. You know, you're just like simple people. <laughs> um, but there are people out there that are not great and they don't have great intentions. And so I'm just very careful about what I, I would show with the baby. Anyway, so this, I, that was a cloth diaper I put on a cabbage patch shawl and then little wool pants I put over it. And that is what I do. That's how I diaper my babies. I put little cloth diapers on them and wool pants or like a wool little shorts because wool can take the place of a plastic diaper cover. It's very absorbent and I, I need, I just need to do like a ton of videos on cloth diapering because there's so much I could say, but I don't have time today because I'm just kind of showing you what I got. I replenished my cloth diaper stash and I have to take care of me. You guys know that I have thyroid problems and it, I think it started in 2020 when I worked through like the COVID madness night shifts. I just don't know, but I kind of got broken. And so I needed to stock up on my supplements and just some tinctures that I keep on hand. I actually went through my medicine cabinet, cleaned it all out and saw what I needed and stocked up on some tinctures and some specialty stuff for after the baby. So I have some tinctures for postpartum cramps. And if you don't know what those are, uh, you haven't had more than two kids because usually starting on baby number three, you get like raging cramps in the postpartum period. So I got some tinctures to help with that and just help with some stuff postpartum cleaned out my medicine cabinet and you know mostly natural here I've got lots of tinctures and my go-to is earthly I do have a code for them I believe it's hopewell heights 10 you can get a discount if you use my code I will link put a list of everything that I like from earthly in the description and put a link and then my supplements um, I get most of my supplements from perfect supplements my discount code for them is also Hopewell Heights 10. All this will be in the description for you guys. But that's just a little peek at what I keep on hand. And, you know, speaking of kind of more along the lines of natural living, I get asked a lot what I do for like cleaning products around the house. Honestly, you just saw me pour baking soda into a skillet, a lot of baking soda and vinegar. I'm telling you guys, when we were first married or like first together, I had no money and Baking soda and vinegar, that was it. That was just it. And that's still it for me. I use so much baking soda and vinegar, but I have upgraded on a couple things. Uh, not much, though. I still make my own laundry soap. So this right here is from Earthly, and it is a natural concentrate, um, just all-purpose cleaner. So it's kind of like a paste, and, you know, put it in your spray bottle, put some warm water in, mix it up, and it's they have several different scents. Well, I say scents, but they're scented naturally with herbs or essential oils. And I'm, that's another thing. I don't use a ton of essential oils in my house um, because they're just very potent. They're very powerful, but here and there, I'm good with it. So once again, I will link all this like natural living stuff, you know, my tinctures, my supplements. I get, I get any cleaning supplies I do get, I do get from Earthly. I really like them. I like that they are not, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to offend some of you, and I don't mean it, I don't mean to. They're not an MLM, okay? I've done MLMs in the past, I've done two of them. And a little fun facts, I actually got to be pretty successful. Got to like some leadership levels, and I, I learned some stuff that made me not crazy about them at all. In fact, it made me quit them and kind of say I wasn't going to do that anymore, and a lot of it had to do with the pricing it just turns out I don't, uh, I, I got to learn that it's not fair pricing a lot. And that is because they need to sustain that business model and pay out those big bonuses. So I really like when I find a company that has like low overhead and they're not doing this, these super unsustainable payout methods or whatever, and they can just keep their prices like really super affordable. Um, and that's why I like Earthly. I like Perfect Supplements because they're just direct to consumer and 
You cannot beat the prices or the quality. And the owners of these companies are unapologetic about that and about their values. All right, well, that wraps it up for this week's video. Thank you for watching again. If you're new and you liked it, then click subscribe. If you didn't like it, then don't click subscribe because you don't need more noise in your life. None of us do. So my little unsolicited advice here, only subscribe to channels that bring you helpful information and are calming to you and don't add stress to your life. All right, well, I will see you guys next week.